Hello everyone, my name is Robert Brown and I'm here to talk about Daniel Morgan's march to the cow pens and how that was a prelude to an epic victory. And in doing so, we need to start with a bit of a prelude. And that prelude begins at approximately 7 a.m. on the morning of January 17th, 1781. Just over a thousand British troops attacked a roughly equal force of patriots in the South Carolina backcountry. The battle list lasted less than 45 minutes, but it changed the course of the American War for Independence. During the fighting, and in full frontier fashion, I may add, American Brigadier General Daniel Morgan quipped, They give us the British halloo. Give them the Indian halloo by God. And that type of pragmatic thought is emblematic of what allowed Morgan and his army to defeat the vaunted British Legion at the Cowpens on that cold January morning. While I'm here to talk about Morgan's march into the Cowpens and his plan of battle, we really need to begin with the effects of the Battle of Kings Mountain the previous fall. And the defeat at Kings Mountain on October the 7th of the previous year was incredibly stinging for Cornwallis. His army had lost one of its key light infantry forces, as well as most of its loyalist militia. More importantly, though, Cornwallis's left flank was now vulnerable to Patriot militia action. Cornwallis had to move his army to feed and supply it, as well as get away from this swarming Patriot militia activity in the, in the area between North and South Carolina. And so in the middle of October in 1780, Cornwallis would move his army away from Charlotte to Winsboro. What this did was it placed Cornwallis's main army within supporting distance of Camden and 96, both areas where Patriot militia had recently become incredibly active. And for their part, the Patriots had reoccupied Charlotte and would use it kind of as a base of operations throughout that raw winter. Horatio Gates, for his part, was relieved as the Patriot commander in the South, and the Continental Congress appointed the man George Washington wanted the previous fall, General Nathaniel Green. Now, Nathaniel Green had a very daunting task put before him. Washington told him he needed to build, quote, an army to look the enemy in the face. When he arrived in Charlotte, he found several pieces of such an army, but most importantly, he found General Daniel Morgan, one of the best natural military leaders in American history. Morgan, for his part, was a wagoner on the Virginia frontier. He had been born in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area, and had, as a, a teenager, had moved in the Virginia frontier, and he had taken up the profession of wagoning, which I think we could analogize as the modern day truck driver. And so what Morgan had done, he, he would haul supplies during the day and he liked to fight and brawl at night. Physically, he was very powerful. He stood a little over six feet tall, probably around six foot two by most accounts, weighed a little over 200 pounds, very solidly built. Um, he'd served with the British in the French and Indian War uh, as a wagoner and he had hauled um, supplies up to Fort Chiswell in Virginia, and he was whipped for an infraction. Uh, and what happened is he had a, a British officer told him to do something, he refused, and Daniel Morgan struck him so hard that the British officer fell off of his horse, and he was uh, sentenced to 500 lashes well laid on. This is designed to kill a person, either through shock or through infection or through other means, but Daniel Morgan, not only did he uh, live, uh, in years afterward, he would tell he would take off his shirt, bare his back where the marks of the whip were, and he would tell people, this is the best the British could do to me. And at other times, he would say, the British still owe me one lash, meaning that he counted 499. Very apocryphal, but it shows you the character of Daniel Morgan. And at the beginning of the American Revolution, Morgan and a regiment of Virginia riflemen were sent north from Virginia to fight with Washington near Boston. And they, then they became later part of the invasion of Canada. Morgan and his riflemen, after they had been captured in Canada and paroled, were later sent by Washington to help General Horatio Gates in what would be known as the Pivotal Battle of Saratoga. Morgan's riflemen and the way that he used them in that battle helped defeat the British, though he received little credit or promotion. Green knew Morgan from his days with Washington and understood that Morgan was a natural leader who understood combat better than almost any other Patriot commander. 
Green determined that he needed to split his army in Charlotte so that it could be supplied from the countryside as well as bolster patriot morale in the wide of an area as possible. This is almost like what Napole one of Napoleon's maxims during his heyday, which was after this, when he said you would, you would divide the army to eat and unite it to fight. So in a lot of ways, Nathaniel Green is becoming Napoleon before Napoleon came on the scene. One part of this army will become what was known as a flying army under Daniel Morgan, and it would march into western South Carolina and harass Cornwallis and fight small battles in the area to annoy the enemy in that corner. So why in the world does Green send Morgan away? It is a logistical problem, and it is a strategic problem. The area around Charlotte and what's modern Mecklenburg County have been picked clean of food and forage. So what happens is if he's going to feed his army, and we know that the army travels on its stomach, that he had to divide to eat and unite to fight. So sending Morgan into the South Carolina backcountry would alleviate that supply problem. And strategically, you place it even a small Patriot army in the backcountry would improve Patriot morale and force Cornwallis to divide his forces to deal with the threat. So in late December of 1780, Morgan was set out and march west, and he came to camp between the Broad River and the Pacolet River. His flying army was eventually joined by Colonel Andrew Pickens and his regiment of militia. And so now Morgan, according to his orders, could operate offensively or defensively, quote, letting prudence and discretion be your guide. So Green didn't tell Morgan exactly what to do, but Morgan knew he was to annoy the spirit of the people and to annoy the enemy in that quarter. And while it seems like uh, Daniel Morgan had the most interesting job, he also was faced with a logistical nightmare. That area of South Carolina backcountry had been relatively untouched, but feeding an army from that area became really tough. Some of the roughest country in the American backwoods of its day. And as his army grew and more men, we're talking militia here, came into camp, they wanted food, they wanted powder, they wanted lead, all of which was in very short supply. So Morgan, much like Green, spread his men out over a wide area to feed them and gather supplies. And by early January, less than a month after arriving, way less than a month, Morgan is in trouble and he wants to move his army toward Georgia. Cornwallis over on the British side is also concerned. He's concerned that Morgan is in his rear. And he wrote to his commander, General Clinton, about those issues where he says, quote, the constant incursions of refugees, North Carolinians, and back mountain men. Now, let me stop for a second. As a North Carolinian, thank you, Cornwallis. We really appreciate that. And quote, the perpetual risings in the different parts of the province, the invariable successes of all these parties against our militia keep the whole country in a constant alarm. So Cornwallis, for his part, understands that the longer Morgan sits in that Carolina's back country untouched, the bigger, more of a problem he's going to have, the less, pa less pacification he's going to be able to produce. He's already lost Patrick Ferguson's uh, uh, loyal American volunteers, his light militia force at Kings Mountain. And so now he knows he has to deal with Morgan's flying army, lest they stir the people up and that country becomes uncontrollable. Cornwallis, for his part, is going to send his own um, striking force under Benastre Tarleton. And Benastre Tarleton had originally had studied law at Oxford University, but he didn't really like studying law. He liked riding horses. He liked playing polo. He liked participating in athletic events. He liked gambling. And during his days, he gambles away a lot of the family fortune that was given to him. And so what happened is other relatives... They purchase him a commission in the British Army. And so Tarleton comes to America at the beginning of the war, a headstrong young man, and he's going to advance himself rapidly through um, his successes on the battlefield. And the British Legion will become known as Tarleton's Legion due to his leadership, and it would strike fear into the hearts of the Patriots. His successes and his exploits, such as the massacre at the Waxhaws, are going to make him a lightning rod for everybody. The name Bannister Tarleton means something. It's like the boogeyman or it's your hero. 
Okay, just depending on which side you were on. And it's only natural that Cornwallis is going to send Tarleton and that legion in pursuit of Morgan and his flying army. To contrast them, Daniel Morgan was in his mid-40s, where Minister Tarleton was in his mid-20s at the time of the battlefield. So Tarleton gets detached. And in preparation for that second invasion of North Carolina, because remember, Cornwallis had to retreat, and he's in South Carolina. He is a Cornwallis and Tarleton devise a plan to rid that back country of Morgan once and for all and destroy that flying army. His legion is going to be reinforced with more men. We're going to give him two small pieces of artillery, which we had not seen in the Carolinas back country. And he's going to go and he's going to maneuver from lower South Carolina and trap Morgan between the legion to the west and Cornwallis's main force to the east and crush him in a giant pincer movement. So Tarleton's operations against Morgan begin on January the 1st. This isn't long after Morgan set out from Charlotte. So these things are happening, if not simultaneously, pretty close. And the orders that he's given from Cornwallis state, quote, if Morgan is anywhere within your reach, I should wish you to push him to the utmost, meaning find him, run him to ground, and destroy him. And Tarleton, on his part, proposes a march on Morgan and drive him toward North Carolina and the ridges of Kings Mountain and into the waiting arms of Cornwallis. I must either destroy Morgan's corps or push it before me over the broad river toward Kings Mountain, Tarleton wrote. And so Cornwallis sends the reinforcements and supplies. And so now the Tarleton's legion will total about 1,200 men, infantry, mounted dragoons, cavalry, and artillery. So Daniel Morgan has a dilemma, and he's afraid of that possibility of getting caught between the two enemy forces. If he retreats to the south, he loses part of his militia. If he goes over that pacolet, he loses part of his militia. If he retreats north over the broad, he loses the other part of his militia. And no matter which way he retreats, the morale of the patriots in the area is going to drop. He would not be spiriting up the people in the area. And so with no good options, Daniel Morgan does the only thing that he could and he begins to move his army northward. And by moving northward toward North Carolina, he can supply his men and search for an advantage to exploit. And by January the 15th, 1781, Morgan's men have been pulled out of their camp near Grendel Shoals and are moving northward toward the Broad River. In reality, this is an escape route. And what I mean by that is Morgan's men are gonna use the Green River Road as the route to march. This is the only way they can escape Tarleton's legion, and they're not real sure where Cornwallis' main force is. So that's going to be the route to the broad. And so Morgan is going to shift his militia to protect that road. And in the meantime, he's going to send a note to Nathaniel Green saying, quote, Nothing can be affected by my detachment in this country which will balance the risks. He knew that Tarleton was after him. And Morgan's wanting to retreat or at the very least change his base of operations. And Tarleton continued that drive northward, aided by arch loyalist Alexander Chesney, who had been at Kings Mountain and captured and was now, you know, who knew the area. This is where he's from. And so he's helping Tarleton chase Daniel Morgan. And uh, uh, Tarleton is going to drive in Pickens Brigade of Militia and they're going to move. They're going to move in retrograde. They're going to move north to join Morgan's main force. The object of this march is the Broad River. And if he can, if Morgan can get across the Broad, that will slow um, Tarleton's advance. He can regroup and decide what to do next. But early on the morning of January 16th, his pickets come rushing in saying that Tarleton had crossed the Pacolet and he was only six miles away and gaining ground. This is knife fighting distance for two armies. And so Morgan's army now, as they begin to move ever faster, look like they're in headlong flight toward the broad. Morgan's going to leave some North Carolina militia to cover the road, to kind of have a little rear guard action, and he's going to send these Continentals, his regulars, northward. And by noon, that North Carolina militia was on horseback racing to rejoin Morgan. This thing is going to become, uh, if, if not a race, something close to it to get to the broad. And late on the 16th, Tarleton got to Morgan's camp from the night before near Burr's Mill. And he found that Morgan had hastily abandoned the camp. 
And what he found there were cooking fires that were still warm, half cooked rations found on these warm coals. His men are going to sit there and they're going to have, they're going to have quite the little feast. And Tarleton in his own memoirs is going to say that he was afforded plenty of rations, which they had left behind them half cooked. So Tarleton rests his men for a very short time during the evening, thinking he has got his prey cornered. For his part, Daniel Morgan is trying to find a course of action that doesn't end in utter defeat. And so Tarleton stepped in the part of the trap that Morgan is going to lay quite um, on the fly. In that area that the armies are marching in, Morgan's men strip it of supplies. And that's going to become incredibly important. His men have a whole lot of time to forage farther afield. So whatever's around them, they're going to take and they're going to eat. Tarleton's men have been on the march for a couple of weeks at this stage, all the way from down near 96. And while he's in a very in, in a dangerous situation, Morgan is playing it well. Because the farther Tarleton's army marches, physically weaker it becomes. Those the, the rations that they found at Burr's Mill at camp were some of the first meal the first meal they had had in, you know, in a while. And so as Morgan's army is picking things clean, Tarleton's army is getting weaker and weaker. All right? So he's forcing him to operate in that barren area. And so now he's forcing Tarleton farther from Cornwallis. And uh, he's moving his own army closer to reinforcements and supplies. So Morgan's army, though it looks like it's retreating, which it is, is getting stronger, whereas Tarleton's is physically getting weaker. And several American officers after the war uh, you know, talked about how Morgan was drawing Tarleton in a trap and away from Cornwallis. I am not convinced that it was a planned trap. But it becomes one. And as the situation evolves, Morgan uses it in that way. So as you can see on this very improvised map here, you see Morgan's route from the Pacolette and Tarleton's route up from the Inori down below, down near 96. And you can see how much farther the Legion has had to march, how poorly supplied they were. And so now Morgan's army, though it looks like it's in a headlong retreat, it's actually in great shape. For his part, Morgan set a grueling pace for his men during those cold, wet January days. Uh, Thomas Young, who had also fought at Kings Mountain, left this to say about the retreat. He said, quote, We were very anxious for battle, and many a hearty curse have been vented against General Morgan during that day's march for retreating. These men came to fight. They didn't come to retreat. Morgan is going to separate himself from the army and take a small bodyguard or lifeguard group with him, including Captain Dennis Trammell, who's a local man, and he's trying to find a place to stand. Because he's done the calculations. He knows how far the uh, Broad River is, and he knows his army will not cross it by nightfall. And if he gets his army straddled across that river, and Tarleton's Legion catches him, they will cut it to pieces. So he has got an incredibly awful decision to make. Where do we stand and fight? And so as he rides onto a place called the Cow Pens, he and Captain Dennis Trammell, they find what they're looking for, the perfect spot to lay an ambush, so to speak, and develop an incredibly innovative plan of battle that will result in the defeat of Tarleton's Legion. And so Morgan supposedly told his men, here, I will whip Benny Tarleton or I will lay my bones. He found just what he was looking for. Morgan's flying army, for its part, arrives at the cow pens later on the afternoon of January the 16th. The Green River Road led through the area, and it's a convenient place for militia to rally. And even the night of the 16th, they continue to come in. To this day, we are not sure how many militiamen Morgan had on hand but he had more than he let on. And so Morgan finalizes that decision to fight late that afternoon. And we know that his army couldn't cross that river and his choice was stark. You can stand and fight or we can run and die. And Morgan, the old wagon or the old brawler, the old, the old tavern brawler has decided that we're going to stand and fight. And if you're on the other end of this thing and you're in Tarleton's Legion and you're right there with Benastra Tarleton, you think you've got Morgan just where you want him. <laughs> he can't get across the river. We cut him up tomorrow. But we know the end. We know what happens. And Benastra Tarleton could not have been more wrong. The ground that Morgan chose was absolutely perfect for a defensive battle. 
It's a relatively wide and open plain. You've got a few old growth trees, but there were some subtle terrain features that you can see, still see to this day. Hillocks, a ravine, a swampy area that are going to have a major impact on the course of the battle. And Morgan's going to use them to his advantage. The ravine and the swampy ground mean that if Benastri Tarleton's legion is going to get at Morgan's men, they've got to come straight down the road. And we know, though, if you know where your enemy's coming and how they have to come, you're at a great advantage. And so that, so that Green River Road bisects the Cowpens and Morgan's chosen battlefield. And that shape of that battlefield is going to act like a funnel. And it's going to steer that attacking force right straight ahead and into any arrangements that the defender devised. And that's exactly what Morgan's going to do on the night of January 16th. He and his commanders are going to devise a defense in depth. He's going to tell the men, just, come on, boys, give them two fires and you will be free. When you get home, how the old folks will bless you and the young girls will kiss you. Others, he went around that night at the campfire, slapping back, sharpening knives, telling stories, telling how he's going to crack his whip over Benny Tarleton the next day. His men were fed. They were rested. They had a plan for battle. And Daniel Morgan said that he went and found a tree, climbed up in it, and prayed as hard as a man could pray, which seems to be the exact thing that any commander should do. But Nostri Tarleton, for his part, his men are still on the hunt. Two o'clock in the morning, they're up, and they're moving down the mud-caked Green River Road, mud clinging to them. They're tired. They're worn out. They've been on the march for two weeks. They've had very little to eat. There could not be a starker contrast among two warring armies. The next morning, those two armies would array for battle and fight one of the most tactically innovative and strategically important battles of the Southern Campaign. In just under 45 minutes of fighting, Tarleton's legion would be destroyed as an effective fighting force, and the course of the war would turn toward Virginia and eventually to Yorktown in ultimate British defeat. The next morning, January the 17th, as it dawned bright and cold, Daniel Morgan went amongst his men and said, Get up, boys. Benny's coming.